Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. I'm excited to have Mike Michalowicz back on the show. Mike started his entrepreneurial career by building and selling not one but two multi-million dollar businesses. He became an angel investor and proceeded to lose everything. That's an expensive way to learn, but Mike has been sharing smart business insights ever since as an author, speaker, and yes, he's still an entrepreneur. Mike is the author of Profit First, The Pumpkin Plan, Fix This Next, and more. His latest book is a new revised and expanded edition of Clockwork, Design Your Business to Run Itself. Beyond being super smart, Mike is really creative and very funny. Welcome to the show, Mike. Roger, thanks for that kind introduction. I think with your book is primarily aimed at entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, do you think that uh, people who are part of large organizations will have something to learn here today too? Oh, there's no question about it. In fact, um, I'm working on a new book for leaders. It's about employee engagement, which parlays a lot of lessons from clockwork. So yeah, there's no question. If you are a leader in a business, if you run a department, there are ways to build efficiencies that will serve your entire company and yourself. Uh, that's a good reason for everybody to stay tuned in. You know, Mike, uh, you start off uh, pretty early on by saying that the real acid test uh, for a business that can run itself is for the uh, owner, entrepreneur, founder, or leader to take a four-week vacation. Uh, yeah. That seems uh, something that's probably unreachable for most entrepreneurs. Uh, explain the logic behind that. Yeah, so as I've been studying businesses of all sizes, most businesses run on monthly cycles. We have to create revenue, uh, service our employees, our clients, uh, close out the books, all within these monthly cycles. And my theory was if a leader can leave the business for four consecutive weeks while that full cycle happens, theoretically they can leave forever. And that is a powerful way of confirming the business can run in absence of that leader. I also, though, as I was studying that, it's like, oh my gosh, now these leaders, these business owners will feel that they're not needed. Like, wow, I've run myself out of a job. But in fact, what you're doing is you're elevating yourself to strategic thinking. Most business owners, leaders, stay doing what they're doing by hustling and grinding, by, by being productive on an output basis, not on a considerate thought basis. So what we need to do is get a break from doing activities to the most actually caloric burning activity of all, which is thinking strategically uh, and thoughtfully. It's not, not a single business has moved forward without strategic thought. If, if they did, uh, if, if you didn't need to think, we would still have square wheels uh, that just existed, but someone took pause and said, maybe a square wheel is not the best approach. We gotta make this round. It was thought that transformed that business. And that's what leaders need to do. And the only way to get there is by removing yourself from the doing. Take that for a vacation. Well, I think too, uh, by getting to that state, uh, they're adding a lot of value to the business. A lot of business yeah. owners and entrepreneurs don't really have an exit plan. Uh, they just I figure, well, hey, uh, I'm doing this. I'm making good money. Uh, hopefully, I'm making good money, and I'll keep doing it as long as I can, and then worry about whatever happens next. But uh, when you can get to the point where the business is running itself, suddenly you have a business uh, that is potentially saleable, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's probably the biggest uh, benefit uh, of not the business not needing you is it becomes turnkey. So a lot of business owners think wrongfully that, hey, if, if I build this business and I see so much value in it, I'm contributing to it so much, the day I sell, others will see the same. But if it's dependent upon their work, what owner would want that? What new owner would want that? Because they see the prior owner is, is asking for money and abandoning the business, and they are the business. So it doesn't make any equitable sense. So when a business doesn't depend on you, it is most profitable. I'll give you a quick story. I travel like yourself for speaking, and uh, unlike you, I go to McDonald's all the time, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I do. So what I started uh, a while back is when I go to a McDonald's, I'd ask the cashier if I could speak with the owner. My reasoning behind this was I wanted to get a sense of how that business runs so efficiently. What I was surprised to find is when I asked for the owner the first time, the cashier said, oh, the owner's not here. They don't come in. I asked the second McDonald's, owner's not here. 50 times, the owner's never been there. One time a cashier said, oh, the owner hasn't been here in a while, but they did come in last week to pick up the money. Pick up the money. I was like, okay, that's what ownership is. You're not in the glorified closet. That's the store manager. What you are is you're someone who's thinking strategically. Other acquisitions of locations. Um, you're, you're meeting with corporate to figure out new plans to optimize what you're selling, new promotional strategies. That's where the heavy lifting is happening. It's not at the floor level. 
And that's what our businesses need to do too. We need to get the owner out of doing, we need to get them thinking and it increases the value. Each McDonald's location is highly saleable because the owner isn't working. And of course, McDonald's is a designed business. It's a franchise uh, that has uh, a whole set of operating procedures to ensure that you know one person isn't uh, uh, holding the whole thing up. And if something happens to them, uh, it fails. But you know, I have to uh, admire your dedication, Mike, uh, to uh, visit 50 McDonald's, interrogate uh, the employees. And you probably even had to sacrifice by having a quarter pounder with cheese and a milkshake while you were there yeah. just to appear to be a regular customer. I had to uh, that is true dedication to the commitment. job. Yeah, I, I, I threw back quite a few Big Macs. <laughs> uh, my guilty pleasure is actually a Whopper. We do not have a Burger King anywhere near us. And I actually do occasionally like that. Even It is fast food. It's not fantastic. Uh, but I do kind of like that uh, flame broiled flavor. So when I'm traveling occasionally, I will stop at a Burger King. So we, we've covered the two two big brands there. You know, I think uh, too, Mike. It's it's not just about uh, the four week vacations. I think that many people, whether they're uh, mostly in an entrepreneurial environment, but sometimes even in corporate environments, they're putting in excessive hours because they're the only ones that can do things. And when things get backed up, uh, you know, they're putting in the twelve hour days or seven day weeks. Uh, because there isn't an alternative. They can't uh, delegate. They can't, uh, you know, assign the test to anybody else. And to me, that's that's as big of a danger as anything else, because that's how people get burned out. There is uh, kind of two factions of growing a business, yet many of us label what we're doing the wrong way. Many business owners, leaders say they're scaling their department, scaling their, their business. The reality is they're growing. That's the other faction. You either have a growth approach or a scaling approach. A growth approach is where you put in more effort to get more results. That's that hustle and grind mentality. That's where these leaders, I see them working 12 hour days to prove their value. And you do see results from that because they're working harder, there's more output. There's a cap, you can't get past that 12 hour limit or whatever, there's exhaustion and the business then starts to flounder. It, it, and, and God forbid the leader's not available, the business drops. Scaling, as opposed to putting in more effort to get more results, is putting in less effort to get more results. It's about leverage. And the leaders who do this seek ways, innovative thinking, to drive the same or better results they have in the past with less resources. And those businesses now have an infinite potential. They can keep on growing and growing. So be very careful, as my word of warning, to say you're scaling a business when you're in fact growing it. We want to scale, but realize you may be growing and you should be pursuing scaling. Mike, you make the point uh, with the metaphor in the book, which is being an architect versus a contractor. Explain that. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a great question. So the contractor is someone who is uh, is overseeing the work, is integrated in, in every step of the motion uh, or action, and they're in what's called deciding mode. There's a Hindu goddess named Kali, and you may not recognize the name, but you definitely recognize the figure. It's that one female head with eight arms. And that's what a contractor becomes someone who's doing all the thinking and is task rabbiting to the people. If you've ever been in that position where you feel, I can't get any work done during the workday because I have to tell everyone else what to do, you're a contractor, you're task rabbiting, you're in what's called the deciding trap, you're deciding for others. The architect, on the other hand, is a designer. The architect outlines what we're looking to achieve, then gives those blueprints to the team to bring it to life. But in the moment, they're making um, strategic decisions. Ooh, I see the vision. But in regards to what we have going on here, we use, need to use different materials or structure it slightly differently. So there's tweaks they move along. That's what's called delegation. And a lot of people say they're delegating when they're actually deciding. Many people are making decisions for others and they become entrapped in that. But delegation is the assignment of outcomes. Here's the vision. Let's make sure we agree to the vision. But your job now is to help us navigate to that outcome that we've agreed upon. And if there's any roadblocks in the way, navigate around it. We want to be architects, not contractors. Now, another point you make, Mike, that I think is really good uh, is that uh, productivity can be a trap. I mean, we all want to be more productive. We don't want to be wasting time. Uh, and we use tools, whether it's you know getting things done or Pomodoro or uh, any of yeah. these techniques that are meant to uh, allow us to get more done in the same amount of time. But uh, really, it's kind of a trap because you can only get a certain level of gain from being more productive and eventually you just hit the wall again. It it's happens. only maybe it's 20, 20% later. Uh, so that's, that's really the wrong path to go down, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, listen, I got the tomato timer at my house and uh, productivity, the challenges that would become impacted. I, when I was writing clockwork, I initially interviewed a, one of the leading productivity, productivity experts in the world. 
And when I met with him, I said, hey, um, why is productivity so important? And he kind of did one of those look arounds where he wanted to make sure no one's listening in. And he looks at me and says, productivity is crap. And I was like, what? He said, here's the problem. Productivity allows us to take a set of work in a, in a specific time period and squash down the time, meaning get the same output in less time. He goes, but what happens is then it builds this gap of freedom, available time. So what we do is we put in more tasks and then we try to pack that down. So we start overloading ourselves with tasks when we pursue productivity alone, we become impacted. But the argument then is we don't wanna become impacted, we wanna achieve organizational efficiency. It's a balance by leveraging other resources. So don't take on more work, delegate more. Find the work that we don't need to do and abandon the work. It's really optimization around and selectivity around what we do ourselves and what others do. And inherently there's redundancy. In the productivity trap, the day you can't crank out whatever you're cranking out, everything comes to a halt because you have this backlog. But if we bring balance and leverage other resources, now we have redundancy in place. Yeah, well, I guess you know, it's like uh, scheduling that. Wow, hey, I can fit in one more meeting today if I do this right. And, really, and then you fill up you know, all of your uh, eight hours. Uh, so, Mike, assuming that we've got some of our audience members who are identifying with this, yeah, they're, uh, they're too busy. They are uh, apparently irreplaceable in their uh, current role, and they don't want to be irreplaceable. They want to be able to at least uh, take a couple of days off, if not four weeks. Yeah. Where does one begin to yes. sort of analyze one's situation and say, okay, uh, how do I develop a clockwork business? How do I get a business that runs itself? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to categorize using a technique called the four T's. We're going to analyze by doing time tracking. I do this once a year. I don't need to track the time I, I work for my work, but for my analysis, I do. So once a year during a normal schedule, usually over two weeks, I track my time. And I'm consistently confounded by how much I misperceive my effort. I spend about 15, 20 minutes a day on email responding to readers. I was spending two hours a day responding to readers. I had that much of a misconception or misperception. So first we analyze our time. Then we categorize it using the four T's. The first T is trash. There's certain activities we do that aren't necessary and we can just abandon them. Often these are historical things. So one thing that comes to mind for me, I bring a newsletter for my readers and it took me about eight hours a month to write this newsletter. And one month I forgot to send it out, just totally forgot. And no one said boo. And I was like, okay. I ran a few tests, sending the newsletter, not saying letter, and no one ever said anything. That's a trashable event. Just because I did do it doesn't mean I should continue to do it. That's a big, big time saver. The second category is transfer. There's work that we do that we may not be productive at, but someone else could be more productive at it, specifically if it's something that, that brings them joy. For me, I was maintaining, we have a little office here, 10 at my author office, 10 folks here. I would do the cleanup. I would you know, clean the toilets and stuff like that because who wants to do that work? Shouldn't the owner do it? And no one else in the world wants to do that work. So I thought until Amy came on board and Amy said, hey, Mike, I see you cleaning the office. Do you mind if I do that? I'm like, mind? What, you want to do this? She goes, yeah. She, she works part-time for us. She says, I got a lot going on at home. Uh, sometimes I just like to do stuff that's kind of mind numbing, thoughtless work and just the process. So I actually get a lot of joy out of the disconnect from having to think. I'm like, yeah. And she does an extraordinary job. Something that I don't value, she treasures and she's extraordinary at. So I was able to transfer it. We should always be transferring to the optimal person. And then trim. Sometimes you have to do stuff that maybe you don't enjoy. Uh, it's not your love of your life, but it's necessary. I got to meet with our team here every week and it's important. I don't necessarily get tons of joy out of it because we have to do some technical stuff and so forth, but uh, it's necessary. So I said, well, is there a way to do this better? And what we did was we did batch meetings. Now we have a daily huddle and in the beginning of the meeting, I'm revealing metrics and just getting some feedback and I can do in 15 minutes. What used to take me 15 minutes times 10 people. So I was able to trim the work down and get the same results. And the last T is treasure. There's certain work that gives us joy and that's where we should be oriented because when we get joy from stuff, we excel at it. I love to do three things I've identified. <clears throat> I love being a spokesperson for ideas. That's what we're doing right now. I love writing about them, books, just like you. And I love being the cheerleader for my company. So those are the three things that represent 80% of my time and I'm excelling. My goal with my colleagues here is to get 80% of their time in treasure work and we can be far more productive. At the end of the day, our little company, as far as we can tell, outpaces our competition almost on a two to one in revenue. It's hard to tell with private companies, but just based on feedback we have with number of employees and the size of the business, we're basically double the output. And 
And I attribute to this orientation toward allowing people to do the work that they treasure. I think it was certainly, Mike, whenever somebody's doing something, they are going to be more effective at it. They're going to be less distracted, uh, less looking for excuses to put something off and do something that's more fun. Uh, so that makes, makes a huge amount of sense. And the fact that you found somebody who even enjoyed uh, uh, cleaning tasks uh, is interesting because I'm sure there are people who love doing, say, accounting work, uh, which yep. uh, is worse uh, than cleaning. one of my nemeses. Uh, I mean, I, I avoid it like the plague. If I've got to you know, do some invoicing tasks or something, I, I'll, I'll put that off as long as I, I can until, okay, I've got to do that now. When it wouldn't have taken that long. <laughs> And I just buckled down and done it. But it's one of those things uh, like uh, maybe, you know, cleaning the office. They say, well, it's not so bad. I, I'll do that tomorrow. So you're finding, finding those people is a trick. Now, a key concept in the book is the queen bee role. And it sounds like, you know, the queen bee would be a person in the organization. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, that's not exactly accurate, right? That's not accurate. And that's what, actually one of the reasons I revised the book was I wanted to address this. There was confusion. People heard this concept of queen bee role. It's derived from beehives. When I'm studying beehives, I use a concept called biomimicry. Find something that nature has figured out and translate it into a business or personal application. Beehives are very efficient. So I said, well, how do we translate this? They prioritize the most important function <clears throat> in the beehive, which is the production of eggs. Their survivability depends on it. Nothing trumps that. Not even collecting nectar and pollen. They simply got to make sure eggs are being produced. If they don't have enough nectar and pollen, some of the bees will actually leave the hive permanently so that the egg production can continue on. Well, in the business, I was like, oh, there's got to be one critical role, the production of eggs, that the business depends on. And we need to know what it is. Now, people get confused. They hear queen bee. They say, oh, that's me. I'm the owner. I'm the queen bee. I'm the most important. It's not the truth. The most important people or persons are the individuals who are supporting the core function of your business. You got to figure out the core function is. And it's real simple. First, figure out what your big promises or your brand promise is another way to phrase that. For example, as an author, I promise to simplify entrepreneurship. That's my promise to my clients, my readers. FedEx promises to deliver packages on time. Well, for me as an author, I then ask myself, if I commit to simplifying entrepreneurship, what are all the activities that support that? Speaking, interviews, writing, videos. Then I ask of all those activities, which one is the most important? And by definition, there only can be one. For me, it's writing books that simplify entrepreneurship. And they better be darn good books. Because if I start writing really bad books, it'll be hard for me to get a speaking gig. Uh, I probably won't get any interviews if I'm writing really bad stuff. So I got to double my efforts. Now, conversely, if my speaking slips and I deliver bad performances, which I do occasionally, the game isn't over because the book carries the momentum. Now, I could flip it and say, I double down on speaking. That's going to be my QBR. And then the books don't matter. I better be a world-class speaker. I better be the next Les Brown or something. And that's just not who I am. So I chose the QBR to be writing books and I do it. Now, as I scale my business, I now have a co-writer, AJ Harper, who works with me. And so I have redundancy there. I'm not the only person working on this. I have an editorial team. I'm not the only person working on this. Back to FedEx, FedEx plant promises to deliver packages on time. They do many things. They have print shops, they have logistics, they have customer service. FedEx could say, you know what? Of all these things, I would argue the most important is logistics. That's what get, gets the packages delivered on time. They can say, you know what? Screw logistics. Let's uh, let's make customer service our most important function. If they did that, they could no deliver, longer deliver on their promise. The news and the headlines would say FedEx packages lost and missing, but you know customer service is answering the phone and really nice about it. They they would go out of business because they've compromised the QBR. Now, if you flip the script and FedEx says, you know what? Screw customer service. We're going to double down on logistics. Now the headline reads, FedEx not answering phone, but every package delivered on time. That may be a sting to their operation, but doesn't put them out of business. A multi-billion dollar business will be compromised and go out of business if the QBR is not addressed, but it won't be permanently harmed if it slips somewhere else. And that's true for our businesses too. If we compromise the core competency, we are done. And if we don't know what the core competency is, we constantly kind of just mingle there and we're never excelling. But if you allow something secondary to slip, it's not going to burn you as much. So know the QBR, and always protect and serve it. Do you find that entrepreneurs uh, typically are serving a big part of that uh, queen bee role themselves? And uh, uh, that's part of the problem? Yes, they are. In a or is that, uh, I mean, you know, obviously, Mike, you have to uh, be a big part of the QBR for your organization. 
but you found ways to support yourself. Uh, yeah. I think that undoubtedly there are a lot of folks in a situation where uh, they haven't been able to uh, build that support team to extend their reach and ensure that right. uh, you know it isn't entirely reliant on them. That's right, and then then you're at risk because if in the day it's the thing of the brain surgeon, their promise is a successful surgery and outcome. The QBR is the procedure itself. They don't do the procedure successfully or don't do it. It's all over. That's a one person operation. That is not a business because there's no redundancy. It's a great freelance job, uh, but it's not a business. So for me, I made a choice. I could make this a freelance business and it's all dependent on me, or I could make this into a true business with, re with redundancy. I've done it multiple ways. I have a co-writer for my books. I also have derivative writers. So Profit First is one of my books. I have now nine other versions of Profit First in circulation. Profit First for restaurants, Profit First for contractors and so forth. And those people are carrying the load of, of writing about this concept and promoting the concept, which elevates the tide and the boats, including my own, gets raised. So once we identify the QBR, our job as a leader is not to get territorial about it and try to block everyone else out. It's to invite others in so that there's protection and redundancy so that it can move unabated regardless of who's available to participate or not. Yeah, that's a great example, Mike, because uh, it is not a necessarily obvious or logical uh, thing to say, well, I'll have other people write books, write my books right. uh, and with my branding, you know, that's usually it's like, okay, uh, somebody's copying my ideas. I'm going to uh, let my lawyer know. But uh, in this case, uh, it's a useful brand extension and you're conveying your ideas uh, to more people and to specialized groups of people. Uh, and I presume it's also driving your core business. So, you know, that's that's great, but it it required some kind of a a leap of creativity to get there. So so I applaud you for that. And another concept uh, that you have, I noticed that there are not only acronyms, uh, but there are alliter alliterative ones. Uh, you have your four uh, T's. What, what about your uh, D's? <laughs> your four D's. Yeah, yeah. So these are the stages of a business and uh, or phases of a business. Every element needs to happen in a business but we as a leader need to elevate to the highest level. So they are as follows. First D stands for doing. A business must be doing work that serves clients and the infrastructural work behind it. 80% of a business's time or more is spent doing. The invoicing, that's some administrative work. The delivery of the service or product, that's doing work. That must be done. But the owner or the leader must elevate them through the next stages. Next level up is called deciding. A necessary component, but in small dashes, it's kind of like salt. It can add some good flavor, but you add too much, it kills the entire recipe. So deciding is where, I talked about that Hindu goddess Kali, this is where we're making decisions for others. And uh, it's nice when the new employee comes on board and they ask questions, they're a learner, and you're, you're telling them to do this, do that. But at a certain point, they keep asking questions, they haven't achieved freedom. So we want to get out of that deciding phase, deciding for them, and move to the delegation phase. Sadly, a lot of leaders say they are delegating when they're actually making decisions for others. Delegation is not the assignment of tasks and giving direction. Delegation is the assignment of outcomes. It's an agreement with someone else saying, here's the outcome we want to achieve. Does that make sense to you and why? Then we have a best practice to get there. Historically, we've done this, but if you have better ways to do it, do it your better way. If interruptions or disruptions appear, how are you going to navigate around it? And when they come back saying, I don't know what's my direction, don't decide for them. Tell them you hired for that thing on their shoulders, that brain of theirs, help us navigate around it. That's true empowerment. And that's what delegation is. And that allows us to move to the fourth and highest level, which is designing. Designing is thought time. And listen, we, we burn a lot of calories, as you know, thinking. It's actually the hardest work we can do. It's strategic thought. It's these if-then kind of statements that run through our mind, and we can have a vision for the future. I believe leaders need to spend a lot more time designing. Otherwise, we'll stay trapped in the historical past and be making square wheels when we could be inventing round ones. You know, when we talk about uh, delegating and such, we one thing that you'll see in just about every book about uh, entrepreneurship and in particular trying to uh, scale a business is establishing 
uh, standard operating procedures, SOPs, you know, whether it's uh, Tim Ferriss or any, any number of uh, internet marketers, uh, that, that's what you're supposed to do. Get SOPs and then uh, assign people to do those things. And, you know, if one person goes away, just slap the next person into the slot and keep on going. Yeah. You talk about SOPs, but uh, they aren't uh, sort of an unmitigated benefit. And what, what are the pluses and minuses of SOPs, Mike? Yeah, the SOP, of course, is, is that you have a standard practice for others to follow. The minus is they got to master that process. They got to learn it. Most SOPs sit on the shelf. I remember going to my own publisher, Penguin. I was meeting with my editor and I looked at his shelf in his office. I'm like, what's that book? I thought it was the Bible covered with dust. I thought it was the original one or something. And he goes, oh, that's our SOPs. I'm like, did you ever, have you ever read it? He said, no. I'm like, oh, that epitomized what happens with SOPs. It's stuff we write for the shelf. Plus the dynamics of modern business culture is things are changing so quickly. An SOP from yesterday may be overridden by new technology today and no longer relevant. So I think a optimized approach for modern business over SOPs is what's called captures. Captures is where you record an activity as your standard operating procedure. So we talked about invoicing earlier, same doing invoicing. Now I use screen capture software to record the process as I'm doing it. And I even have a voiceover dictation explaining what I'm doing and then give it to the next person to replicate. But here's the key, and this is the biggest thing that SOPs don't have. There's a saying that the best student is the teacher. We need to deploy that. Don't just give someone that video to follow. Within a week or two of them having this process, make them create a new video teaching the process because the only way they can be masterful at the execution is when they can teach it. Once they teach it, now you know they can do it, but also you've captured their approach, the improvement to the system, and now you have your new capture. If they elect to leave, you the video to transfer to the next person for them to learn, for them to teach, and now you're retaining all that knowledge. Yeah, I love that idea because often if uh, you or I are explaining somebody uh, how to do something, we have done it so many times, know how to do it so well, uh, that we don't explain it very well. You know, it's, it's like we skip over steps that are obvious to us, but to a person who's not familiar with it, they aren't going to be obvious. So by right. having the person who you teach then teach it, uh, they may they may catch a lot more of those. Uh, anyway, uh, Mike, I don't want to take up much more of your time. How can people find you and your ideas? I'll tell you where not to go is MikeMichalowitz.com. And while I love you to go there, that's my website. No one can spell Michalowitz. So here's where you should go. It's MikeMotorbike.com. It goes to the same site, by the way. But that, that's my nickname from grade school. It's the only G-rated nickname I've ever had in my life. Other ones were not so uh, internet friendly. So go to MikeMotorbike.com. My newest book, Clockwork, Revised and Expanded, is there. You can get free chapters. All my books, you can get free chapters. I wrote for the Wall Street Journal for, for a couple of years. You can get those articles. And I do have my history of podcasting up there, too. So MikeMotorbike.com. Great. Well, we will link there and to any other resources we spoke about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. Mike, been great to catch up. Thanks for being on the show. Always a joy, Roger. Thanks for having me.